pray before we get started. Dear Jesus, we just pray that we can get into a worshipful mindset for you, Jesus, just to give you the glory right now. And uh, just that whatever's going on in any of our lives, God, is so insignificant compared to the promises that you have for us and uh, the eternal life that you have for us, God. Um, so we're thankful for that. And we just want to praise you and exalt you for everything that you are today in our lives. And God, we pray that we can know you better through this time. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I sing, and I sing praises to your name, and I sing praises to your name, the name that's so much higher than all names, all oh, Oh, Lord. 
surrender all. I'm living for your glory. Passion in my heart, this stirring in my soul to see the nations bow for all the world to know. I'm living for your glory on the earth. For the sake of the world, burn like a fire. Every heart that 
Jesus. Um, God, we just give, um, we give you our lives, God, as you gave us life, God. God, this song that we were just singing says, you are love, and I think that that's um, such an amazing truth, God, is that not that you, um, not that you are loving God, but you are love itself. And Jesus, as we understand what that means more, God, we realize that there is no love outside of you. And God, that you are truth and you are life, God. Those are you, God, they define you, Jesus. And God, we just pray that we can start to um, learn how to love others, God, like the way you love us, Jesus. And see them the way you see us, God. You love us so much, God, and we give that back to you today. And praise, God, for what you've done and what you're doing. It's, our, it's your breath, God, in our lungs. It's the reason we're alive, God, to honor you. So we make that our prayer today, Jesus. And in your name, amen. Amen. Hello, everyone. It's so good to be back. I have missed seeing you all so much. And so I am just thankful that I'm feeling well tonight and can be here with you. And I just wanted to tell you about a couple of things that are happening. Um, this week, we're going to be starting back to our women's Bible study, which is going to be Thursday evening. So I hope that we women can come to that. It's going to be great. We're doing the book of Romans. So I'm really excited about getting into that study. Um, we'll be here at 7 o'clock on Thursday, so if you can make it, let me know. Um, I have a sign-up sheet. 
there was supposed to be a sign-up sheet, but there isn't one. So you can just tell me personally if you're going to be here. Uh, I want to have a study for you. And also, um, we're moving the women's breakfast from this coming Saturday to the following Saturday, which is the 24th, to enable anyone who wants to go to Modesto next weekend for their conference, their day, s day conference. Um, so just take note of that. I hope you can come to that, too. Anyway, uh, we wanted to say a couple things about the men's study. They're studying on Tuesday, the book of Hosea. That's at 7 p.m. Uh, the Bible bus is on Wednesday evening at 7 p.m., going through the Bible in a year. And um, we also want you to save the date for our all-church fall potluck coming up on October 15th. They're going to also have a youth dessert auction that night, so that's always fun and a good time to get to know other people in the church and just to have fellowship together. So those are just a few things happening. Talk to me later if you want any more information on the women's things. All right. You want to just say hello to someone who's next to you, and we'll keep rolling here. She's doing better. She, uh, and the Lord's answering our prayer. Well, welcome to the Saturday afternoon service again. Seems like we're always here. It's a good thing, isn't it? It's always good to be together in the house of the Lord, gathered in his name to read his word, worship him, and study together. Amen. As our usher comes to receive our afternoon tithes and offerings, we will read Psalm 64 together. Hear my voice, O God, and my complaint. Preserve my life from dread of the enemy. Hide me from the secret counsel of evildoers, from the tumult of those who do iniquity, who have sharpened their tongue like a sword. They aimed bitter speech as their arrow. To shoot from concealment at the blameless. Suddenly they shoot at him and do not fear. They hold fast to themselves an evil purpose. They talk of laying snares secretly. They say... Who can see them? They devise injustices, saying, We are ready for a well-conceived plot, for the inward thought and the heart of a man are deep. But God will shoot at them with an arrow. Suddenly they will be wounded, so they will make him stumble. Their own tongue is against them. All who see them will shake the head. Then all men will fear, and they will declare the work of God, and will consider what he has done. The righteous man will be glad in the Lord and will take refuge in him, and all the upright in heart will glory. There's the promise, and all the upright in heart will glory. Thank you, Jesus, for your word. Thank you for your promises that you give us. We know that your promises are true and righteous altogether. Amen. Today we're going to continue on in our study in this wonderful book of First Thessalonians. We're Continue on in the message, the admonishment to the ideal church. This is part two. We've been learning in our study in the book of First Thessalonians exactly what the church needs to do to effectively carry out God's plan of salvation. This letter of First Thessalonians has taught us as believers how to discipline ourselves concerning our behavior as Christians. Last week we looked at First Thessalonians 5, verses 12 through 22, which is the, a very excellent list of exhortations given to us by the Apostle Paul concerning our Christian conduct, both in and out of the church. We studied together verses 12 through 14, and we began building our list of admonishments from the Apostle Paul to us as the church. The first admonishment was that Paul taught us to admonish the unruly, this admonishment was given to us in the church so that we might confront one another in the church so as to promote the process of sanctification, being set apart for holiness. Paul gave us this admonish admonishment so that we might judge one another, judge one another inside the church, not judge those outside the church. Judgment, we learn, belongs to God for those outside the church. But inside the church, 
The Lord's called us to judge one another, holding each other accountable to be sanctified. Holding each other accountable for the purpose of being set apart to do the work that the Lord's called each one of us to do. Paul admonished us as a church body to encourage the faint-hearted. This admonishment was given so that we might lift up those who are struggling in the church in their faith. Those who were beaten down by the worries and the anxieties of the world. Those who really need a friend or brother or sister to come alongside them to develop a relationship of support. Number three, Paul instructed us to help the weak. When Paul referred to the weak, he was talking about spiritual weakness. Paul called us as brothers and sisters to seek spiritual restoration, sanctification, on behalf of the one who is struggling in their walk of faith. He called us to do it with gentleness and love. Paul said to bear one another's burdens, thereby fulfilling the law of Christ. This admonishment was all about holding on to weaker brothers and sisters by holding them accountable in their commitment to be sanctified. We need to hold each other accountable, don't we? Not just the weaker, but we need to hold each other when we're strong, to be accountable in our commitment to be sanctified. Amen? And number four, Paul admonished us to be patient with everyone. We learned that being patient was not only waiting, but it also describes overlooking a transgression. We learned that King Solomon said that it's a man's glory to overlook a transgression. I challenge you to consider that in forgiving others, overlooking the transgression, we place ourselves in a position of true liberty true freedom. That's where the Lord wants us to live our lives, in a position of true liberty, understanding that because the work was finished at the cross, we don't need to strive. He finished the work at the cross, giving us the grace that totally removes all of our sins. Why do we struggle? Because we hold on. The flesh wants to hold on to vengeance. It wants to hold on to unforgiveness for others. God's called us to live as his children, as people, freedom, we also, at the same time, are carrying the one who has offended us. We lift them up, literally, and carry them to the cross where they can find the Lord's grace. The Lord's grace, which alone is sufficient to remove their sins. That's what we need to do as believers. Forgiving one another so that we can carry those who are in need to the cross. Amen? That's what King Solomon was talking about. That's why it is a glory to man to be patient, to overlook a transgression, because that's what we're doing. We're just carrying those who have need of forgiveness to the cross. That's what we should be doing, isn't it? Isn't that the great commission, to take the gospel message to, lost, to the lost world? Once again, we also challenged ourselves last week to be quick to share the gospel message with those around us and to consider that time is of the essence. We read in Genesis together last week, 6, 3, that the Lord said that his spirit will not strive with man forever. We need to have a sense of urgency in sharing the gospel message with people. Today we're going to continue now in building our list of admonishments, beginning with our first verse for the day, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 15. See that no one repays another with evil for evil, but always seek after that which is good for one another and for all people. Don't pay back evil for evil, admonishment number five. Paul here is exhorting us to do something that so often seems to be impossible. And it, indeed, it is impossible if we're trying to operate in our own strength. But with God, all things are possible, amen? Amen. Apostle Paul is effectively saying that when someone does you wrong, when someone purposely sets out to harm you, forgive that person even if they don't apologize. Even if they're not sorry for what they've done. Even if they willfully did you wrong, forgive them. Don't let your forgiveness, in other words, be contingent on the other person's remorse. That's grace defined. That's the definition of grace. Anything that is other than that is not grace because it has a contingency. Did his grace have any contingencies for us? 
The scripture says, while we were dead in our transgressions and sins, he died for us. Does that sound like a contingency to you? It sounds like unconditional love, unmerited favor that he showed to each one of us as his children when he redeemed us back to the Father. His amazing grace, finished work of the cross. That's grace defined. No contingency on the one who committed the infraction as concerning their remorse. It's your glory, Solomon says, to overlook the transgression as we learn, as we learn from verse 14. We're carrying this over now. Don't pay back evil with evil. It's your glory to overlook the transgression. Paul doesn't just leave it there with forgiveness, though. He challenges us to do something, doesn't he? He challenges us to prove our sincerity in the forgiveness by going out of our way to do something good for that person. We're going to go a step beyond now. Paul's saying, don't just forgive them, unconditionally forgive them. Do something good for them. Go beyond now, this is absolutely 180 degrees, listen to me, the exact opposite of what our fleshly nature tells us that we should do. Our sinful nature tells us to immediately strike back. Defend yourself. Get even with that person because what they did to you is wrong. Well, let me tell you something. The assumed truth in this verse is that the person, in fact, did commit a wrong against you. That's not up for debate. The person did, in fact, commit a wrong against you. That's assumed. That's implied. So often we justify our evil response, returning evil for evil, by analyzing how horrible the infraction was that was committed against us. Don't spend any time analyzing the infraction concerning its magnitude and how great the infraction was. Don't spend any time in that mindset. You know why? Because that's what the enemy wants us to do. He wants us to get caught up in an emotional response, doesn't he? The heart is desperately wicked. He wants to stir that up. And getting involved in analyzing the severity of the infraction gets us emotionally stirred up until we get into a fit. And when we get into a fit, guess what happens to our behavior? Our behavior is no longer in line with what the Apostle Paul is telling us right here in his word. We are no longer transformed in our thinking. We have become conformed to the world. The world delivers evil. The, and Paul says, don't pay it back with evil. That's what it means to be conformed, isn't it? And that's what the enemy wants to do. He wants to, to draw us into this analysis process. Well, how? What, let me see if I can think about this. Scripture says to dwell on whatever is lovely. Don't be dwelling on the things that are evil. But instead, forgive the person unconditionally and then do something good. Do something good for them. And that's exactly right, Mickey. Put it in the Lord's hands. Vengeance is mine. Leave it with Jesus. Remember, we learned that God, it's God's place to judge those outside. Inside the church, we should judge one another. We should hold each other accountable for what we know God's word says we should do. Amen? The assumed truth in this verse is that the person did, in fact, commit a wrong. We should ask ourselves this simple question, what would Jesus do? Have you guys heard that? <laughs> what would Jesus do? We have a culture today that wears bracelets, right? All kinds of different bracelets. And, then one, of, and one of them is the bracelet that says WWJD. And we wear that proudly as Christians. What would Jesus do? I'm not talking about a secular culture. I'm talking about the Christian culture. These are Christians who are proud to wear the band WWJD. What would, what would Jesus do? Why do we ask that question is the, is the question I have to us as believers. Why do we ask that question, what would Jesus do? After all, Jesus was God in the flesh, wasn't he? He was God incarnate. So we can expect, expect him to have grace and unconditional forgiveness, right? Because he was God. Is that the reason that he expressed unconditional forgiveness and grace? Because he was God incarnate? Because he had the, the, the right to be the Holy One in that situation? Because he was indeed the Holy One in the situation? Why do we ask that question? Remember, as I've taught you before, listen to me now. Remember, as I've taught you before, that Jesus, in his human flesh, exercised his God-given free will and chose to be obedient to the Father in heaven. He made a willful choice in his humanity to choose to be obedient 
to the Father in heaven. That's why we ask the question, what would Jesus do? It's not because he was God, it's because he was 100% human. And he made a choice, didn't he? And we want to follow his example. We want to exercise our God-given free will and choose to do what Jesus would do. So if we ask that question, we've got to make sure that we're really, really sincere about it. If we're going to be a Christian culture that wears the bracelet, we have to know what we're saying. Peter showed us Christ is our perfect example. In 1 Peter, remember we just studied this, right? In 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 21 through 25, look what Peter gives us. Jesus says, Christ is our example in this chapter. It's beautiful. For you have been called for this purpose. Each one of us have been called. For this purpose, now listen now, this is the purpose that, for, for which we've been called. Since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example for you to follow in his steps, the example is what? Suffering. Who committed no sin was nor any deceit found in his mouth, and while being reviled, he did not revile in return. While suffering, he uttered no threats, but kept entrusting himself to him who judges righteously. And he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. For by his wounds you were healed. For you were continually straying like sheep, but now you have returned to the shepherd and guardian of your souls. That we might die to sin. What would Jesus do? He would have us to die to sin. He would have us exercise our God-given free will, and choose to be obedient to the Father, which means we must die to sin. If we're reviled, we shouldn't revile in return. Apostle Paul is telling us not to pay back evil with evil, but instead to do good. What would Jesus do? When Jesus was insulted, he didn't answer back. That's what Jesus would do. What do we do? Can we do this when we're insulted? What do we do when we're insulted? I'll tell you something. We can we can, in fact, do what Jesus did. The answer is yes, if we understand that we have been called, as that verse in Peter just told us, that we have been called for this purpose. What purpose? To suffer. To be insulted. To be reviled. Or evil to be committed against us. Because it's in demonstrating our, resp our response, the choice that we have been given to make, that we demonstrate what grace is all about. It defines grace to a world that is lost. That's the purpose that he's called us as Christians to fulfill, and that is to demonstrate unconditional love and forgiveness of the Father. To, to, to be a testimony and a witness of what it is that he's done for each one of us. Simple as that. The purpose of giving a testimony and a witness to Jesus and his saving grace is embodied in what the Apostle Paul is telling us here. And why is it a testimony of his grace? Because no person can do it in their own strength. You cannot do this in your own strength. You guaranteed in your own strength and your own flesh, you will return insult for insult, and you will pay back evil for evil, and you will get caught up in the process of analyzing just how wrong you've been done. And all that leads to is unhappiness, bitterness, anger, malice, greed. It is, every single evil thing comes as, is born out of this mindset. Mm -hmm. I was thinking the other day, you know what the first, two, the first two letters of the word mean are? I hadn't thought of it either until the Lord brought it to me. The first two letters of the word mean are me. You know what's right at the center of being mean is you, each of us in our flesh. And we're supposed to be dying because we've been called for the purpose of suffering. We're supposed to die to the flesh, die to self, die to me instead of feeding it. And the enemy wants us to feed it and justify it. He wants us to return evil for evil. The question is this, did Jesus the man, in his flesh, the man, Jesus, 
born in the major, did he do this in his own strength? Did he suffer in his own strength? Did he do the things that he did? Was he obedient to the Father in his own strength? We just read what Peter had to say, didn't we? The answer is no. Peter said he, Jesus, kept entrusting. He kept entrusting himself to him. Him, capital H, would be the Father. Jesus kept entrusting himself to the Father in heaven. That's him with a capital H. Jesus drew his strength as a man from the Father because he made a choice to entrust himself. The word entrusting implies a free will choice. That's what he did. He actively chose to place himself under the authority of the Father. Now, as Christians, we've been called for a purpose. The question is, will we do as Jesus did? What would Jesus do? He kept entrusting himself to the Father. What will we do? We say we want to do what Jesus did. We already know as believers what Jesus would do. The question is, is what will we do? What will we do? We have a knowledge in our heads of what Jesus would do. Are we following his example? Peter tells us and he challenges us to follow Christ as our example. I love the way the, uh, the prophet Isaiah phrased this truth. This is where it's from. It's from the old covenant. The prophet Isaiah, listen to this. Isaiah 53, 7. You've got to love the book of Isaiah. I mean, you have to. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to slaughter, and like a sheep that is silent before its shears, so he did not open his mouth. He being Jesus. Isaiah was telling us all about the Savior, wasn't he? If we really truly want to be followers of Christ, if we want to be effective Christians, then we must draw our strength from the Father when we find ourselves being insulted and done wrong by anyone. When Jesus suffered on the cross, he never threatened to get even. If we think about the evil that is done to us, how does that compare to being nailed to a cross? Think about this. This is a question that we should ask ourselves. When we feel like we've been done so wrong, how does that compare to being nailed to the cross? And yet, Isaiah says he did not open his mouth. He was led to the slaughter, but did not open his mouth. Are we willing to follow Jesus as our example? I'll tell you something. So often, we're just, we just, all we have to just do is be, barely be offended, and we're, we're ready to go. Game on. I'm in it to win it. There is no winning in that game, is there? No. Vengeance belongs to the Lord. The conclusion that we should come to is that it doesn't, there's nothing that we can, be, can be done to us that compares to Jesus being nailed to the cross. Why? Because Jesus was sinless. He didn't deserve that. The other conclusion that we should come to for sure is if we look at ourselves, really truly look at ourselves in the mirror, we should be nailed to a cross. That's the conclusion we should come to. And we rightfully deserve to be there. And you know what the sad part about it is? If we were there and we were hanging on the cross for our sins, we would not be redeemed as a result. You can pay the price with your life for your sins, and you know what? Not sufficient. Why? Because you're not a spotless sacrificial lamb. You're not, the, you're not able to remove your sins. Only the spotless lamb can do that. And yet, if we follow him as our example, we realize that he did not open his mouth. Jesus, as a man in his human flesh, led by example. Could he have gotten even with those who were persecuted him? Could he have? Well, let's just look at something here for a second. Let's look at the Gospel of Matthew. Matthew 27, 54. Listen to this verse. Now the centurion and those who were with him keeping guard over Jesus, when they saw the earthquake and the things that were happening became very frightened and said, truly this was the Son of God. They came to a realization, didn't they, of who exactly who Jesus was. Well, let me tell you something. When they came to that realization, they realized at that point that he willingly remained on the cross. He could have done any number of things to take care of the business of getting even. But instead, he willingly hung there on the cross. And that's what evoked in them 
That's what invoked in them great fear. Such great fear and reverence for the Lord at that point that they recognized who he was. They said, this truly was the Son of God. What does it take in our lives for us to get to the place where we say, he is truly the Son of God? So that's what it means to have a healthy fear of the Lord. So often we're just going about doing our thing and, and we get all involved in all these conflicts and opening up our mouth and defending ourselves and fussing and arguing with everybody and having unforgiveness and everything. You know what? We need to be standing right where the centurion was. We need to be in a position where we truly recognize he's the son of God. Those persecutors realized that Jesus was God. They realized that Jesus chose to not get even with them. They realized that when he was on the cross that he forgave them without their even asking. Here's a perfect example of forgiveness with no contingency. Did they ask for forgiveness? No. They didn't ask for forgiveness. They didn't repent of their sins. Luke says it perfectly in his gospel account. Luke 23, 34. Look what, look what Luke says. But Jesus was saying, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they cast lots, dividing up his garments among themselves. Obviously, they didn't know what they were doing. They were still looking at the material things of this world. And he was pronouncing forgiveness. Forgive these people. Jesus not only forgave them, but he went on to die for them. Conquered death for them. And made available to them the gift of everlasting life, just like he did for us. If we, if, listen to me, if, if we really, really desire to properly respond to people who have done us wrong, we must do more than ask the question, what would Jesus do? As believers, we must do what Jesus did. We must do what Jesus did. We don't have to ask the question. We know what Jesus would do. We have the word of God sitting before us. We have to do it. We have to do what Jesus did. We can only do it by submitting ourselves to the Father's will and not our own. That's what Jesus did. He submitted himself into the Father. He said, nevertheless, not my will be done, but yours. And he submitted himself to the Father. That's what we have to say. Nevertheless, not my will. My will is to get even, Lord. My will is to return evil for evil, but not my will be done, but yours. And what's his will? To do what Jesus did. And what did Jesus do? He forgave him with no contingency. It's a perfect picture of his unconditional love and grace. And that's what we're, as ambassadors, that's what we're supposed to be doing in a lost world that we're living in. That's what we're supposed to be doing in the culture that we live in. We're supposed to be the light and the salt. We're supposed to be taking the gospel message with complete urgency as we see people around who desperately need Jesus. Amen? God the Father expects every Christian to follow the example that is set by his son. Why? Because we deserve the cross. Follow the example set by his son because we deserve the cross. His son did not deserve the cross, and yet it pleased the Father. It pleased the Father for the son to be willing to be insulted and to suffer so that we might be saved, might be redeemed back to him. It pleased the Father. Did you hear what I said? It pleased the Father for his son to suffer and be insulted for our sake. Where do you get that? Where do you get that? What kind of a loving father? This is why the world doesn't understand his grace. What kind of a loving father would be pleased for his son to be insulted and to suffer? I'll tell you something. Listen, in my humanity, when my children are insulted and suffer at the hands of those who would do them wrong, I am not pleased. I am not pleased. I become angry. I, I, I don't immediately think about what would Jesus do in this situation. I think about what I'm going to do to anyone who insults and causes my children to suffer. And yet the scripture tells us that God was pleased. How do we know that? We've got to go back to this same passage I took you to earlier. Isaiah 53, I read verse 7, but now I want to give you guys something. I want you guys to see how important it is to read the word in context in its totality. I want you to understand how essential it is for us to come to terms with who we are and who he is. He's a good, good father. That's who he is. And we're loved by him. That's who we are. In order to fully grasp that concept as we sing it, we have to be in the word. 
So sometimes on Saturday afternoons, we get into big sections of Scripture, don't we? It's like right now it's critical that we go ahead and do the whole of Isaiah 53. If you don't know the Isaiah 53, the whole chapter of Isaiah 53, print it out, paste it on your dashboard, put it somewhere where you can read it on a regular basis. Isaiah 53. To answer the question, we go back to Isaiah. Listen to this language carefully as Isaiah the prophet describes the suffering servant. This chapter is about the suffering servant. This is about Jesus. And he describes Jesus perfectly as our example. We should follow. Read it with me. 53, verse 1. Who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He's talking to us, isn't he? As a church, listen. He's talking to us. For he grew up before him, before him, capital H, before who? Before God the Father. For he, Jesus, grew up before him, God the Father, like a tender shoot and like a root out of parched ground. He has no stately form or majesty that we should look upon him, nor acceptable appearance that we should be attracted to him. It wasn't because of his physical beauty and his looks and his stature. Listen. He was despised and forsaken of men a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And like one from whom men hide their face, he was despised. And we did not esteem him. We did not hold him up. We did not lift him up. Listen. Surely our griefs he himself bore and our sorrows he carried, yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken. Instead of lifting him up, we esteemed him to be stricken, beaten, smitten of God and afflicted. This is what we wanted. Crucify him. Every one of us in the crowd, we like to believe it's not us, but it's not true, is it? What shall I do with Jesus? We want to be Pilate sometimes. Don't we just wash our hands of his death on the cross? No. You know, it's us in the crowd, isn't it? This is what we esteemed. We esteemed him to be smitten of God and afflicted. What shall we do with Jesus? What shall I do with Jesus? Crucify him. Put him on the cross. But he was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our well-being fell upon him, and by his scourging, his stripes, some translations say, we are healed. All of us like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way, but the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. This is God's son, his own son. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. This is where the Apostle Paul is quoting right here. He didn't open his mouth like a lamb that is led to slaughter and like a sheep that is silent before it shears. So he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living for the transgression of my people to whom the stroke was due. It's due for us, isn't it? The punishment's due to us. His grave was assigned with wicked men, yet he was with a rich man in his death because he had done no violence, nor was there any deceit in his mouth. He always told the truth because he always submitted himself to the Father. The Father is the embodiment of all truth. No deceit in him. Listen to this now. But the Lord was pleased to crush him. The father was pleased to crush his son. This, 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 this should break us down as, as God's children. It should break us down and drive us to our knees before the cross. The father was pleased to crush his son, putting him to grief, if he would render himself as a guilt offering. If he would render himself as a guilt offering. Did he? What did Jesus say in the garden? He said, nevertheless, not my will be done, Father, but yours in heaven. He was telling us something in his humanity. He was saying he actively chose to submit himself to the Father's will. This is the prophecy given. Look, if he would render himself as a guilt offering, did Jesus have a choice? Whenever the word if shows up, I'm going to tell you something right now. You explicitly have a choice if he would do this. 
What did Jesus say in the garden? He said, Father, if there's any way, here's that word again, let this cup pass from me, if there's a way. But instead, he said, nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done, Father in heaven. And the Father in heaven was pleased to crush the Son. If he would render himself as a gift offering, thank you, Jesus, that you did, he will see his offspring. Offspring? Who's the offspring? That's us. That's us. Church, that's us. He will prolong his days, and the good pleasure of the Lord will prosper in his hand. As a result of the anguish of his soul, he will see it and be satisfied. By his knowledge, the righteous one, my servant, will justify the many. Jesus, the righteous one, will justify the many, and he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will allot him a portion with the great, and he will divide the booty with the strong, because he poured out himself to death. And was numbered with the transgressors, yet he himself bore the sin of many and interceded for the transgressors. Therefore, I will allot him a portion with the great. It would do us well as believers to read this short chapter, 12 verses, every single week, for the rest of our lives. It should be read. It should be meditated on and it should be contemplated because it reminds us of something very important. What would Jesus do? In his humanity, in his humanity, what did he do? He chose to be obedient to the Father and that's what he's calling us to do. He's called us for the purpose, as Peter said, of suffering in this world so that we might point people to Jesus. Do we embrace that call that the Lord's given us as a church? Or are we constantly looking for some kind of easy believism? Are we always looking for some kind of feel good? Are we looking for health and wealth? Why does the health and wealth movement ever even get started? All you got to do is just pick up the word. You just, it's just all over the place. It's like, how does something like that ever just go all through the church? You know why? Because people want to they, they, the people want the flesh to, to indulge it. They want to satisfy it. It feels good. I'll tell you something. It pleased God the Father to crush the Son who was sinless. What should we be doing as Christians when we find ourselves being crushed by the world? Paul says we're to, we're to forgive. We're not to repay back evil for evil, ever. But instead, we are to return good to everyone, to others and to everyone. He tacks that on. He says to others and to everyone. You know what that means? He's saying that includes inside and outside the church because the others is the people in the church. I got news for you. And, and everyone includes the rest of the people outside the church and the fellowship. Do good. Do what Jesus would do. Do what Jesus did. Don't wear the bracelet if you're not going to do it. We don't even need to ask the question, do we? Because we already know. You already know. I used to always tell my children that when they were little. You already know about your good old papa's love for you, but you don't really know. Did they really know? Not a chance. Do they even know at this point in their young adult lives? Nope, they don't, do they? And how, as an earthly father, how much more does our heavenly father know the good gifts to give us? Do we really know how much he loves us? If we did, we would be different. We would live differently. We would act differently. We wouldn't be offended by someone who wants to commit some kind of a, a, a wrong against us. We'd look at them and smile and say, the father is good, and I want to do good things for you. Oh, you, you insulted me. Let me get let, a kind word, the scripture says, return, uh, turn of the way wrath. You know, or like the apostle Paul said, the fruit of the spirit, the attributes of the fruit of the spirit, against such things there is no law. Galatians 5, right? I'm being too kind in the office today, I think we're going to have to let you go. <laughs> I don't think you'll hear that, do you? I don't care if it's just what kind of secular place it is. 
They've got to conjure up something else. And please, Lord Jesus, let it not be found on our record that we return evil for evil, but that instead that we're Christians, Christ-like people who follow his example and return good for good. Let's move. No, we're going fast, aren't we? We're, we've covered one verse. Okay, let's go. 1 Thessalonians 5.16, next verse. Rejoice always. Is that the entire verse? It's the entire verse, isn't it? <laughs> Rejoice always. 1 Thessalonians 5.16. Two words. Now, how much time can we possibly spend on a verse like this? Rejoice always. I don't know. It's the admonishment number six that the Apostle Paul has given us. So let's go. Let's see what happens here. Let's really think about this. Another way we could say rejoice always would be to say, uh, be full of joy. Filled with joy continually. Be joyful. It's interesting that this admonishment comes right after the challenge that Paul gave us to not return evil for evil. He's saying, don't return evil for evil. Don't do this. And then the admonishment all of a sudden is rejoice always. Sounds like there's a connection between the two. I guarantee you that when you repay evil for evil, listen to me now, when you repay evil for evil, you will not be full of joy. He says, don't return evil for evil, but do good. And when you do that, when you're obedient to that admonishment, guess what starts to happen over here on the next one? Rejoice always. You start rejoicing. If you return evil for evil, you won't be full of joy. You'll be full of bitterness, anger, and guile, malice, and every other evil thing like we just talked about. So how is it that we can be full of joy in the midst of difficult circumstances? We have to do as our brother James says. Now, you guys know how I feel about James, right? James says to consider it all joy when you encounter various trials. He doesn't say if, he says when. Consider it all joy when you encounter various trials. Remember the word consider? We studied that, right? Consider was to think on something for the purpose of coming to a conclusion. Consider it. Meditate on it. Think about it to come to this conclusion. What's the conclusion that James wants us to come to? Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance, and let endurance have its perfect result, that you might be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. How many people want to be lacking in nothing? You want to be perfected in your faith in the Lord? You want to be perfect? Perfect? Bumper sticker. Christians aren't perfect, they're forgiven. Wrong. Wrong theology. Christians are perfect because they're forgiven. If we didn't stand in a state of perfection all the time before the Father in heaven, then the enemy, the accuser, comes along and what? He accuses us day and night. Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father and says, No, it belonged to me. Covered at the cross, covered by the blood, sins removed as far as the east is from the west. Done. Amen? If it's done, it's done. If the, he, Jesus says the work is finished, then it's finished. Remember in the study of James, we decided that joy was one of the attributes, one of the attributes of the fruit, singular fruit of the Holy Spirit. Well, I'll tell you, it's only by the power of the Holy Spirit, therefore, then, that we can have the joy in any circumstance that the Apostle Paul is talking about. You cannot rejoice always if you don't have the Holy Spirit, indwelling Holy Spirit, because joy is one of the attributes of the fruit of the Holy Spirit. You can't have the fruit without the vine, can you? I just heard Charles Stanley the other day on the radio. I, I couldn't, I had to listen to a message that I know, but I had to stop. I couldn't, I couldn't go any further. I had to just pull over and just like, Okay, talking about abiding in the vine. Thank you. Well, that's a, if, if you don't abide in the vine, the branch is cut off. There's not going to be any fruit hanging off that branch, is there? You've got to abide in the Lord. It's only by the power of the Holy Spirit that we can have joy in any circumstances, including, listen to me now, including the circumstances that we perceive to be good. See, here's where the problem is. <laughs> it's a perception problem. People of the world who don't even have the Holy Spirit can be happy, can't they? I see them all the time. You think, oh, why are those people so happy? You know, why are they so happy? They're happy because things seem to be going their way. Well, I'll tell you something. Listen to me now carefully. It's only by the power of the Holy Spirit that we can have joy in any circumstances, including those that we perceive to be good. 
The real truth is that we have a perception problem. <laughs> we have a perception problem. We don't really know what is good for us, do we? We think we do. Oh, that's no good. That's a bad deal right there. I got a raw deal in this situation. Hmm. As parents, we've experienced this with our own children. They often don't know what's good for them, but as loving parents, we do. Amen to that. Mom and dad sitting over there. <laughs> what? It's like, that's not good for me. It's like, well, yes, it is. It is good for you. Well, I don't think so. We have a perception problem as children. We don't often know what is good for us, but our loving parents do. We know his parents, we know as parents that sometimes that indeed it's good for our children to suffer. And we also know sometimes as parents when something seems to be going very well that it's not really necessarily good for our children. Think, oh boy, we're about to see a crash here coming because this, everything seems to be going well here and that's just not necessarily good. As God's children, we should always know that our Father in heaven is good, and he knows what is good for us. And he has a perfect plan, the word tells us, for each one of our lives, which includes, by the way, take note, suffering. Thank you, Cynthia, who has been suffering. He is writing your testimony through your suffering. He's sanctifying you and setting you apart through your suffering through these trials that you've been going through. Driving you to your knees, oh yeah. Desperately driving you to your knees at times, begging him for his mercy, for his help in your time of need. If we didn't have the trials and the sufferings, we would walk away from him, wouldn't we? We should always know that our Father is good and that he has a perfect plan for us, which includes suffering. And trials. Why? Because these sufferings and trials conform us to the image of his son. They perfect us in our faith, as James says. They drive us to our knees to trust in Jesus as our Savior, to do what Jesus would do, to follow his example that he set for us by being willing to go to the cross, pleasing the Father because he exercised his will to be obedient. We can't do it on our own. We can't be joyful in our own strength. We need to call on the power of the indwelling Holy Spirit. When we call on the Holy Spirit, our testimony is powerful because we become a provoking person who draws other people to our Savior. When we operate in our own strength, we have no joy, and we become a bitter, complaining Christian that becomes really, when it comes right down to it, that becomes an effective tool in the hands of the enemy. We begin to effectively repel other people away from Jesus rather than to draw them to him. Don't wear the bracelet, WWJD, and then complain all day long at work about how people are mistreating you. Because you repel them. You're hypocritical. You are not following the example that Jesus set for us. Take the bracelet off and try to see if you can just blend in. You know what? And it's sad, isn't it? So much so that the church in the world today is blending in. Jesus outside the door knocking, the Laodicean church, lukewarm, spit you out of my mouth. If he's not in the center of the worship, you just blend right in. Beautiful social program, social gospel. Hey, you know what? It's like we can compromise with anything in the word because it's really actually a matter of interpretation. It's all relative to the times that we live in. I don't think so, do you? I think God's word is absolute truth, and never, ever can we compromise with his word. If we're truly able to rejoice always, if we are to really, truly be able to rejoice always, to be full of joy, we must realize two important truths. Number one, God the Father through Christ Jesus, his Son, loves us. God the Father through Christ Jesus, his Son, loves us. That's truth number one. And because of that truth, number one, we must completely immerse ourselves in serving our Savior, in serving Jesus as our Savior. That's the second truth. If we are to rejoice always, we must in our consciousness be aware that God the Father, through Christ Jesus, loves us unconditionally as his children. He has nothing but good for us. That's all we need to know in order to be full of joy, that he has nothing but good for us. He wants us to be perfect and complete in our faith and our trust in him. He's prepared a place for us. He promises that where he is, we can be there with him. This is the promise that he's given us, that Jesus has given us. He's a good father. Let's look at a couple of great historical figures that illustrate where joy is not to be found. Rejoice always. 
Now let's look at some history. So let's look at some characters in history, amazing characters in history, for an example of where it is not to be found. It is not to be found in unbelief. Voltaire was an infidel of the most pronounced type. He wrote, I wish I had never been born. That's what unbelief does. The person ends up at the end of it saying, I wish I had never been born. Do you love the life the Lord's given you? Do you wish that you had never been born? No. Unbelief. No joy. It's, it's not to be found in pleasure. You can't rejoice always if you're looking for the pleasures of this world. Listen to this. Lord Byron lived a life of pleasure, if anyone ever did. He wrote, quote, the worm. Listen to this now. The worm. This is out of the book of Revelation. The worm, the canker, and the grief are mine alone. He was experiencing heavy, heavy grief and burden. The worm is described in, in, in the book of Revelation as being ne that, that the worm that never dies, eternal suffering and punishment. Lord Byron lived a life of pleasure. He didn't find it. It's not to be found in money. Jay Gould, the American millionaire, had plenty of money, plenty of money. When he was laying on his deathbed, he said, in quote, I suppose I am the most miserable man on earth. How much of his money did he leave behind? All of it. Get to the end and make that statement. You're not going to rejoice always. You'll be suffering. And torment forever and ever. We've got to start practicing rejoicing now because we're going to be rejoicing forever and ever, singing praises to his name around the throne. Amen? The new Jerusalem. He's prepared a place for him that where he is, we can be with him. We're going to rejoice always. We better start now. We better get in the practice of doing it now, today. Come on now. It's not to be found in money. It's not to be found in position and fame. Lord Baconsfield enjoyed more than his share of both of these, position and fame. He wrote this, quote, youth is a mistake. Youth is a mistake. Manhood, a struggle. Old age, a regret. Does that sound like somebody that knows about the Lord's grace? I don't think so. God doesn't make mistakes. That's what, that's what abortion is all about. The whole theme of abortion is this is a mistake. It's like, no, no, uh-uh. Manhood is a struggle? No. Not when you know Jesus and you know his grace. It's a beautiful journey, isn't it? Old age or regret? No, my promotion's coming. I'm ready to go home and be with the Lord. <laughs> Just looking back across the whole lifetime of regrets tells you that there's no joy in that, right? Because there's no grace, there's no forgiveness. It's not to be found in military glory or power. Alexander the Great, perfect example, conquered the known world in his day. Having done so, he wept in his tent because he said, quote, there are no more worlds to conquer. Can you imagine that? You're the, you're, you're the king of the world, and now you're just crying. You know why? Because there's no joy, is there, in power and glory of military prowess. King Solomon, when he wrote Ecclesiastes, to, Ecclesiastes, told us the exact same thing. He said it was vanity of vanity, man's toil, his attempt at finding joy in serving himself. Solomon concluded that the only joy to be found is in God. Our Redeemer. That's it. What did Solomon have? He had that whole list that I just gave you. He had all the power. He had all the money. He was the wisest man in the world. He had all of the things that the world could offer, and yet the joy left him, didn't it? He pronounced it to us, and he gave it to us in the Word. We can always, always know that we can only rejoice. We can only be full of joy only when we give our lives to Jesus. It's only in Christ alone that we can be filled with joy and rejoice always. We have to live in the truth of John 3.16. We have to live in that truth, that God the Father loves us unconditionally through his Son. 
When we know the joy that comes through the indwelling Holy Spirit, we also know that it can never be taken away from us no matter what happens in this life. No matter what happens. Remember the word happiness. Listen to me carefully now, church. Remember the word happiness and the word happens share the same root, happenstance. What's happened to us in America today, including in the church, is we believe that we're entitled to happiness. We're only guaranteed the right according to our Constitution, to the pursuit of happiness, not to happiness. And it's interesting to take note of something. As believers, are we constantly pursuing happiness? Because if we are, we're looking the wrong direction. Happiness was not listed as one of the attributes of the fruit of the Spirit. Joy was listed. Jesus considered it a joyful thing to go to the cross for us because it pleased the Father that he would be crushed so that we could be saved. What do we consider the trials and the struggles in life? What do we consider when people do us wrong? Do we repay evil for evil? Think about it. Think about this message. It's here. Think about it. Listen to this promise now, given to us by Jesus himself in the Gospel of John. Jesus was telling his disciples about his death and resurrection. Jesus was telling them about his unconditional love for them. Listen for it here in this passage. Listen. John 16, 22. Therefore, you too have grief now. Jesus is talking to his disciples. You too have grief also along with me. But I will see you again, and your heart will rejoice. Here's the rejoice always. And your heart will rejoice, and no one... No one will take your joy away from you. Alexander didn't have that joy right there, did he? He was crying in his tent because there was no, nothing else to conquer. Jesus says that we, as his children, are more than conquerors. More than Alexander the Great, uh, I think so. He was a conqueror. We are more than conquerors. What is a conqueror by definition except one who goes into a battle and wins? If we are more than conquerors, how could you be more than that? I'll tell you how. Every battle that you face in your life from here until the end, you already know you have a victory before you enter the battle. That's how you're more than a conqueror, because of the finished work of the cross. That's what Jesus is telling us. He's saying, listen, no one, no one can take your joy away from you. No one will take your joy away from you. What does that mean to us as his children? We need to be living in that. We need to be rejoicing always, because that, that statement right there is enough, isn't it? The second truth that enables us to rejoice always is that we must immerse ourselves in serving our Savior. If we immerse ourselves in anything, listen, if you immerse yourself in anything, it leaves no room for anything else. Simple principle to understand, and yet difficult to execute because our flesh wants to be served rather than to serve. As believers, we must recognize that the enemy wants us to focus on ourselves rather than on serving the Lord, rather than serving others. Serving ourselves leads to something. It leads to discontentment, as we just looked at these great historical examples. That's what they were all doing. They were serving themselves. It leads to discontentment. Serving the Lord leads to contentment and a fullness of joy. It enables us, empowers us to rejoice always. How do you know this? Once again, look at what Jesus said in the Gospel of John after he washed the disciples' feet, giving an example of serving others. This is his, uh, the, what would Jesus do? This, what did Jesus do? This is what he did. He washed this, the disciples' feet. Look at this. Let's don't miss this. John 13, 12 through 17. So when he had washed their feet and taken his garments and reclined at the table again, he said to them, do you know what I have done to you? Did they? They didn't know at that point, did they? Because they, they were on the front side of the cross. We're on the back side of the cross now. We know. You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. Do we call him teacher and Lord? You can, anyone can make that statement. Jesus is Lord, and you know what? That's right, isn't it? But think about this. If, and here's that word again, if I then, the Lord and the teacher, washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. If I did this, did he do that? It's implied that we should do exactly the same. For I gave you an example that you should 
also do as I did to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a slave is not greater than his master, nor is one who is sent greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, what things? If you know these things, what things? The example that Jesus set for us, do we? What would Jesus do? If we know these things, if we know what Jesus would do, this is what he's saying to us. You are blessed if you do them. You are blessed if you do them. He didn't say, well, you might be. He said, you are blessed if you do them. Guaranteed. We can only rejoice always. We can only be full of joy. We can only be blessed if we follow the example that Jesus set for us. And that can only be accomplished by yielding ourselves and our will to the Holy Spirit, the power of the Holy Spirit. And if we do, we will be blessed. 1 Thessalonians 5, 17. Pray without ceasing. Pray without ceasing. Admonishment number seven is to pray without ceasing. I feel like the Lord's telling me that right now is a good place to just, just to stop. Do you want to know what this one's all about? This admonishment number seven, pray without ceasing. You do want to know, don't you? You want to come back next week and find out? <laughs> exactly. Because I think that we have, you know what, I think we have everything that we have right now is enough, isn't it? I think we have enough material to go and go to, and to really ask the Holy Spirit, the indwelling Holy Spirit in each one of us to make us aware of what Jesus did so that we might become the children that he's called us to be, that we might be children that know that he's a good, good father and that we're loved by him. That's who we are when we put our trust in him, amen? That's who we are. That's who we are. We're saved. Not by anything that we've done, but we're saved by his grace. Let's have a compassion for the gospel message. Let's have such a passion for the gospel message that we do not allow the enemy, do not allow the enemy to indulge our, to cause us to think, to exchange the truth for a lie, to put us in a position where we believe that we're ever justified in not extending grace to anyone, to anyone. Because of what he did for us, amen. And you know what's amazing about his grace? He taught us how to pray, and he said, forgive us as we forgive those who have trespassed against us. And you know what? It's an amazing thing, his grace. It's all about freedom. It's all about liberty. What is so difficult for us to understand? Why is it so hard for us so often to understand the flesh? Because I'll tell you something right now. God has not called us to remove anyone's sins. He's only called us to forgive them and therefore eliminate off of our shoulders the burden of carrying an infraction that's not rightfully our own. That's what grace is all about. He wants us to live like people of freedom. He's, he's removed all of our sins by his work on the cross, and he says, and I don't want you to be walking around in bondage to someone else's sins. I want you to forgive them. What would Jesus do? Just what he did for the centurion. He just... Wants to re he just wants us to reach a hold of them, forgive them unconditionally, extend grace to them, pick them up, carry them to the foot of the cross, lay them down at the feet of Jesus, and just say, I, I'm doing something good for you. you, do, you you're doing me wrong? No, I'm going to do something good for you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take you to the Lord. There's nothing better in life that we could do for anyone than to take them to Jesus. And if you get to thinking that you're doing some all these good turns and all these good things, you can get caught up in a pharisaical mindset so easy. Oh, look what all I'm doing to serve the Lord. You know, doing this and doing that and doing all these things. We've got to take them to Jesus, right? Because the only thing that matters is forgiveness of our sins because we're going to spend eternity one place or another. There's only two classes of people. Amen? Those who are lost and those who are saved. Represented perfectly by the two thieves hanging on the cross. 
one on either side. If you're the Savior, if you're really the Christ, get yourself down and get us down as well. We don't want to have to deal with the rightful consequences of our sin. Get yourself down off that cross. That's the enemy speaking, isn't it? That's the pride. I won't have to pay the dues for my life. Jesus didn't come off the cross, didn't come down off that cross, did he? He hung there willingly. He submitted himself to the Father's will. The thief on the other side said, you and I are guilty. He acknowledged his guilt. He repented of his sin. He acknowledged who he was. And he said, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said, today you'll be with me in paradise. We share the gospel message with people so that they might come to that place where they repent and they say, I need the Lord's forgiveness. And the only way we can... The only way we can give that testimony and witness to them is for us to tell them that that is exactly the same place that we were in before we gave our lives to Jesus. That is exactly where we all are until we turn to him and say, I repent. Remember me when you come into your kingdom. The problem with the church is this. Is they're explaining away the consequences of sin. We can be forgiven, but I'll tell you something. Neither thief came down off the cross, did they? Both hung there and died. Both guilty, both sinners. And I'll tell you something right now. It's like we can't live our lives just any old, every way that we want to. As soon as we start doing that, there's consequences. Oh, yeah, we're forgiven, but there's consequences. Let's be a people who stop that in our lives by asking the Lord to do a work in us, change us. This list of admonishments that occurs right here at the end of this beautiful, beautiful letter to the church at Thessalonica, these last admonishments are a list that we have to look at. Ask the Lord to help us to exercise our free will to choose to be obedient, just like Jesus was. Amen? Well, let's pray. Let me just pray, and then we'll talk. Lord, I just thank you, Jesus, for your unconditional grace on us, for your, your, your unmerited favor, Lord. You have, you have given us the example by submitting yourself to, the, to God the Father in heaven, and we want to do the same, Lord. We want to be people who stop struggling and wrestling. We want to be free of this, the temptation of the enemy to... Indulge our flesh, Lord. So we ask by your spirit, Lord, that you would deliver us. That we would, in fact, be obedient to your call. That we are called for the purpose of suffering so that the world might see you, Jesus. The suffering symbol lifted high on the pole. It's the only way that we can be saved. Help us to point others to turn their eyes up and look at you, Jesus. We pray this in your name. Amen.